Very good. Kia ora koutou. Um, I'm going to talk about using count data and estimates of connectivity to quantify and predict the success of Popocatio translocations. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge all my co-authors, actually. There's quite a few people who have contributed to this work, several of whom are in the room. Zoe, of course, who has just spoken. Uh, Neil, who's um, contributed monitoring data from Munga uh, Doug, who's, who's led the modelling. And then um, I believe Colin um, Scali was also in the room, a fantastic scientist at Papa, who's, who's led Popocatia monitoring at Zealandia. Uh, Tim Lovegrove, a also a fantastic scientist, one of the nicest men in the world, um, who's done a lot of the monitoring associated with this work. Sandra Anderson at University of Auckland led the monitoring on Rangitoto. And uh, Mike Graham led the monitoring on Tiritiri Matangi for many years. Um, Mike actually passed just a couple of years ago. So if we start, start off with a very short history of conservation translocations, there's been a lot globally, thousands upon thousands of them, and everything within animals from, say, mussels all the way through to elephants. And a, a feature of these translocations is that success rates have generally been quite low although it, it does vary depending on the species and the site. However, they have been a really, really key conservation tool in Aotearoa for some of our most iconic species and iconic recovery programs, such as this uh, beautiful little Chatham Island black robin here. Uh, this is a male by name of Hauraki, a good friend of mine. So given the low success rates, a really, really important question for translocations is how do we measure and predict success? Now, the dominant theme in the literature has been to conduct meta-analyses, which basically look at a binary outcome, success or failure. But the problem is that these meta-analyses have, have typically compared groups of animals with very different life histories. So not quite mussels with elephants, but say, you know, large groups within either mammals or birds. They've also tended to use um, quite different data sets, which have often been collected over very, very different time frames. And so you know, you're, you're comparing quite broad groups here. Another feature is that most of the meta-analyses have typically measured easy to measure variables, which is things like how many animals are released, how were they released, which is typically a delayed versus a, an immediate release protocol, and whether the animals were wild or, or captive reared. Now, these variables are, are undoubtedly important, but they're not the most important things when we when it comes to determining and, and measuring translocation success. And so a more useful approach is to make full use of the data that's available to, to us. Now, the gold standard is vital rates, which you know, Josh sort of um, acknowledged earlier with some of the key work. So our vital rates are, are really when we're looking at individual survival, our males versus our juveniles, adults versus, um, sorry, adults versus juveniles, males versus females, and then productivity. So how many offspring do we get per female? That's the gold standard, but of course it's very expensive and, and resource intensive. We can also use counts, which are, are, are applied at a lot of release sites, not just for the translocated species, but often for broad sort of scale surveillance monitoring across a range of different species. And we can also make use of occupancy data. So how does occupancy change over the course of, of time from release? Basically, what we want to be able to do is use these monitoring data to improve our predictions. And what we really want is, is populations that increase and in, in persist over time. We want this, this lovely little curve here. So if, if we think about how we get this curve, there's those variables that we that I acknowledged before that have often been used in, in the meta-analyses and so forth. But a, a more important variable in terms of determining translocation success is actually habitat and habitat quality. And we define habitat after Hall et al. as the resources and conditions in an area that produce occupancy, including survival and reproduction by a given organism. Now, the tricky thing with habitat quality, of course, is that it, it varies a lot. Some places are better than others. But again, we use Hall et al. in, in terms of uh, their definition, which is the ability of the environment to provide conditions appropriate for individual and population persistence. What we want is in places with really good habitat quality, animals survive better, they have more babies, and populations grow fast and get big. Now, when we think about habitat quality in Aotearoa, we 
intuitively tend to think of vegetation associations. So here's four different habitat types. On the left of the screen, there's a salt marsh habitat at Pawatahanui, um, where I introduced some matata fern birds some years ago. Uh, next to that is beautiful coastal forest on Mangere Island, Mangere Island, um, which of course is a critical site for Chatham Island black robins. Alongside from that is is uh, Mount Hirakimata, um, the top of Aotea, Great Barrier Island, with Hauturu Otoi hovering in the distance in the horizon. And then lastly, we've got Ratakati Scenic Reserve, beautiful forest habitat around a small freshwater lake. At each of these sites, we're going to expect some overlap in species, but we're also going to expect, you know, some species to be unique to these particular habitats. And even though we often don't explicitly label them as a habitat variable in New Zealand, of course, um, our, our introduced predators also have a really big impact in our translocated populations, especially our rodents, shiprats, uh, very much so in our forested habitats, our stoats and our cats. Now, when we're thinking about translocations, we have a pretty good understanding of, of different vegetation associations that our translocated animals might need. And we also have a, a pretty good understanding of the thresholds of, of um, uh, pest control that we might need to, to do in order for these animals to establish and persist. Um, we know that really well for a very small number of animals, actually, including our well-known birds, but we do have pretty good um, rules of thumb that we can work to. However, there's another habitat variable, which uh, Manaya and Zoe have, have both spoken about today, which is really important in terms of determining translocation outcomes, and especially so for our mainland translocations, which is where a lot of our effort is currently going. And that, of course, is connectivity. And what I mean by connectivity is the degree to which a managed habitat is connected to unmanaged habitats. And in the Aotearoa context, managed pretty much always means pest control. So if you have a look at the, the bottom box on the left there, um, that green blob there is a wee island. And for a lot of our translocated animals, if we put them onto an island, they're not going to leave. You know, the water barrier around there represents a barrier that they're not, most of the birds at least, would not be willing to cross. And of course, at an island, it, it's really hard for our invasive mammals to, to reinvade once they've been removed. It happens, but very rarely. At the other end of that spectrum, if we go to the other side, we might have a, a fully connected patch of habitat. So imagine a thousand hectares of habitat under pest control, which is surrounded by an otherwise much larger area of unmanaged habitats where there's no pest control. So say maybe another 10,000 hectares that surrounds this 1,000. The problem here, of course, is that for a translocated animal, when we release them in the middle, the difference between the managed and unmanaged habitat is just a line and a map. And unfortunately, most of our translocated animals don't read maps, and so they can freely move across those boundaries. Which brings me to Popokatia or whiteheads. So they're a wonderful little bird that was once distributed right across forested and scrub habitats into Ika and Maui, uh, the North Island. Um, but they've now got a much, much more restricted distribution, the classic sort of patchy but widespread. And they've tended to persist in the, in the higher, wetter, colder places in line with, with work by Susan et al. So they clearly have a moderate vulnerability to invasive mammals. Um, ship rats are almost certainly the biggest problem for Popokatia, although stoats and cats will also take them. Um, They've been translocated to 21 sites over about the last 35 years. Uh, translocations have, have typically been a, a single release of between 40 and 100 birds, although there is one site where translocation effort was much, much higher than that. Um, the initial releases were onto islands, and uh, more recently they've been released into fence mainland sanctuaries, both uh, ring fence sanctuaries and peninsula sites and also um, into unfenced mainland sanctuaries. Now, the interesting thing with, with Popokatia is that if you release them on certain places, such as islands, they just go nuts, which of course is a pattern we see with lots and lots of birds. But on Tiritiri Matangi, there were two releases of 40 birds each um, about a year apart uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. And that population has done incredibly well. Um, the estimates now are that there's over 2,000 Popokatia on this 220 hectare island. And of course, the animals can't leave once they're there. So that's 
almost certainly why, right? It, it's hard for the animals to leave. And of course, there's no invasive mammals at all at that site. At the other end of the spectrum, we released um, 40 Popocatia into the Hunua um, in 2003. And um, the site that we released them into then was a, at that time was about 600 hectares of intensively managed habitat. It was being intensively, intensively managed to protect a remnant population of Kuokako. Um, but it was surrounded by an otherwise unmanaged habitat totaling around 25,000 hectares. And that translocation failed. So we were quite interested in that that translocation failed, even though there was good pest control in place. It was certainly in line with, with other sites where Popocatia had persisted. So we were quite interested in the degree to which connectivity might be impacting um, translocation outcomes. So of the, the 21 sites, we had eight sites um, that we have uh, used for, for the analysis that I'm presenting today. And um, these eight sites include two offshore islands, Tiriti Matangi and Rangitoto, uh, four fence sanctuaries, Tafaranui, Mangatauteri, Zelandia, Shakespeare, and then two unfenced sanctuaries, the Hunua and one in the Hunua and one in the Waitakere ranges. Now we chose these eight sites out of the um, out of the 21 because they have really good monitoring data associated with them. Uh, at most sites, it was five minute point counts, which many of you would be familiar with. At some of them, there was also um, also and or transit counts conducted. And a transit count is basically where an observer walks slowly along a transit, counting all birds heard and seen uh, 10 meters either side of the line. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the monitoring areas varied in size from 100 and, uh, around 120 hectares, about 3,200 hectares. There were six to 21 years of data per site and 42 observers collected these data with a median of 80 counts each and a range of 15 to almost 4,000 counts, um, which I'm fairly sure was Tim Lovegrove. Now for each of these eight sites, we also measured connectivity in three different ways. So the first way we measured it was what we called buffer permeability. And this is the proportion of the two kilometer buffer surrounding the release area that has vegetation two meters or more in height and gaps of 250 meters or less. And this is habitat that we think that Popocatia will happily move through and or use. We also measured perimeter permeability, which is the proportion of the perimeter of the release area with vegetation of two meters or more in height. Again, something that we think Popocatia will willingly move through. Finally, we, we measured what we call a habitat ratio. And this is the proportion of habitat in the buffer um, out of that available in both the buffer and the release area. So what we then did, I say we, we um, Doug led this modeling is we modeled these data in three steps. All eight populations were modeled simultaneously at each step. And then the first, which is represented by these points and error bars, we took the unconstrained annual estimates plus 95% credible intervals, accounting for count type and, and random variation amongst both the sites and the observers. The black lines on the graph show trends inferred from a model where the growth parameters were estimated separately for each population. And then the red line shows population growth inferred when growth parameters were modeled as a function of connectivity. Um, in this example, um, perimeter permeability is showing, is shown, but the curves were, were pretty similar for each of the three measures. So if we start on, on Tiritiri Matangi and Rangitoto, our two island sites, you can see that these populations have, have both grown really well. Tiri in particular has grown extremely fast. If you have a look at the y-axis, it's actually um, twice that of Rangitoto. So Rangitoto is a younger population. Um, uh, so it's, it's grown a little bit slower there. It's probably also a slightly harder site than Tiri, um, but both of these populations are doing well. And if we have a look at the connectivity, I mean, they're islands, right? So the animals are not going to leave. Um, on Tiri, um, they've got a three and a half kilometer water barrier. We don't have a single confirmed or even suspected example of Popocatia trying to disperse across that. On Rangitoto, uh, same thing, there's a water barrier. Um, it, it, 
Rangi Totoa course is connected to Motutapu, the island immediately next door, but it's also pest free. And um, yeah, so the animals aren't going to leave. If we then go to our, our four fence sanctuaries, um, Shakespeare, Tapurunui, Mangatauturi, and Zelandia. So if we go left to right, top to bottom, um, the the populations go from the most, uh, sorry, the, the lowest connectivity to the highest connectivity. Um, but you can see Shakespeare, Tafurunui, and Mangatauturi in particular at each site. Again, the growth is really, really good. Um, and those populations are, are cranking along. At Zealandia, again, if you look in the y-axis, um, you can see that it's it's on measured on a slightly lower scale. There's still good population growth there. A population has established, but it hasn't cranked along to quite the same extent as Shakespeare, Tafurunui, and Mangatauturi. And again, this is the most connected site. So if we look at these sites, both Shakespeare and Tafurunui are fence sites, but they're peninsula sites. So the, the fences at the base are open-ended, but most of their perimeter is water. So it's a, it's a hostile barrier to um, Popokatia. They have a little bit of connectivity out to the western boundary at each site. At uh, Mangatauturi, um, it's surrounded by a, a mosaic of, of pasture and sort of gully, um, uh, gully vegetation patch and so forth. But again, it's, it's a mix of hostile and, and habitat that Popokatia might use. Zealandia actually has quite high connectivity, um, higher than I, I would have expected to, you know, for, for a successful site. But we do sort of wonder about the quality of some of that habitat outside of Zealandia. There's quite a bit of tree fern and, and quite scrubby, rough, um, rough country. If we go to the Waitakere and the Hunua, there's basically been no population growth at either of these sites. Um, in the Waitakere, we've got a little bump in the graph there um, that doesn't represent any sort of population growth that represents translocations. That's one site where there was huge effort. And there were eight translocations or eight releases over a 12 year period for a total of about 653 birds, but it still failed. And the Hunua, which I talked about earlier, also failed. And if we have a look at both of these sites, if you're in the managed area versus on the boundary versus 100 meters out of that boundary, there is no difference. So there's no barrier whatsoever for the animals moving um, from the release areas um, out into the unmanaged habitats. So for these data to be really useful, what we want is to use them to, to be able to make predictions about what will happen at a new release site. So we have two sites, one Bushy Park Tarapurahi, we released 50 um, Popokatia there, Popokotia, um, uh, as they're known down in Bushy Park Tarapurahi, Whanganui area. So we released 50 birds there in, in 2022. And then we have another site called Hooper's Bush, which is out of Atanui on the Kaipara Harbour. And we're planning to release 40 birds out there um, next year. So based on, on what's happened at our other eight sites, what do we think is going to happen with these two sites? So if we look at the intrinsic rate of increase from each of the sites, which has to be above zero, of course, for the population to increase, we can see the filled black circles are um, Tiri, Rangitoto, Shakespeare, Tafurunui, Mangatauturi, and Zealandia. These are sites that have established really well. The Huna and the Waitakere below that zero course has failed. Based on these sites at Hooper's Bush, um, which is the white open circle, and Bushy Park Tarapurahi, the other white open circle, at both of these sites, we think the intrinsic rate of increase will be above zero. So we do think that these populations will probably grow. But you can see that the credible intervals are super wide. So we, th there's a lot of uncertainty around our estimates there. And if we predict our, our mean population growth as a function of connectivity, and um, we have three different measures of connectivity here, um, the solid red, blue, and orange line, the dotted lines are our credible intervals. Again, at each site, we can see that we do think there's going to be population growth here, but there's a lot of uncertainty around the estimate because, of course, we're trying to make predictions based on a, a relatively small sample. But in conclusion, connectivity is a really useful predictor of translocation success, but it's actually really, really difficult to quantify. Um, it was a lot of work on Zoe's part to, to quantify the, uh, the connectivity of each of these sites. And uh, Doug made comments about banging his head against the computer in terms of modeling these data. We actually started with the study as a pilot study to then move into a larger multi-species project. 
um, but it actually ended up sucking up a lot more time than we anticipated. However, translocation to, to big connected mainland sites is kind of the final frontier for, for getting a lot of our birds back in the bush where they used to be. And to really, to do this really well, we'll make this typical call for reintroduction biology, we need more monitoring, because if we get more monitoring, we can make better predictions. We also need more sites, you know, with translocations, a translocation is essentially N equals one. But if we do more sites with good monitoring, we get better predictions. And if we can make better predictions, we get more translocation success, which basically means we get lots of lovely little female pupukatea like this, sitting tight in the nest and having lots of babies and repopulating all those places where they used to live. Thank you.